Welcome to The E! Show with Neil Raven. Founded in 2013, the EHL has become the college placement leader on the East Coast. Sit back and learn more about the next step in your junior hockey career. Welcome to the E Show, presented by the Pony Box Foundation. The foundation's mission centers around their daily motto We take care of our own, as they help out all of those within the hockey community who have experienced a catastrophic event. Learn more at PonyBoxFoundation.org. What's up? My name is Neil Raven. And this is episode number 99 of the E Show, and we kick things off with an interview featuring Paul Fine Lease, an alumni of the Vermont Lumberjacks, and a dual sport athlete at Middlebury College. Continuing on with the weekly rundown, the E Crew recaps the 2021 All Star Classic and resets the EHL and EHLP power rankings. Up next, we provide the latest update in the Fantasy Challenge, and then wrap things up with a discussion on the second annual Thanksgiving throwdown between the Walpole Express and the Seahawks Hockey Club. I'm joined now by Paul Fine-Lease, an alumni for the Vermont Lumberjacks. How's it going, Paul? Good. How are you? Thanks for having me. I'm doing well. Thanks for coming on the podcast. You're now at Middlebury in the NESCAC, so let's jump right into things. You had kind of a unique path to get there. You actually committed to Middlebury to play golf and walked on to play on the hockey team. Can you kind of take us through that process? Yeah. um, So I... Played for CP Dynamo my senior year of high school, and that um, I was always serious about hockey, obviously, but that kind of um, took it to another level and decided to play junior after high school. Went to Brockville, Ontario, uh, my first year in the CC, and had a it was a it was a good season. It was a it was a tough year, um, very very packed full with uh, learning experiences, but um, didn't didn't end up well the next season. So kind of bounced around, tried out for teams. Uh, didn't really go so well in my second year uh, and ended up taking a break, took a break from hockey. was very frustrated with it um, and started playing golf seriously. Uh, so I took the year off and then missed hockey so much and I knew I knew I couldn't be without it. So reached out to Coach, Coach Masso, um, got the ball rolling there, and then, then the rest is history. So in terms of the, the walked on part of it, though, um, cause obviously so many players when they're in the AHL are trying to finalize a commitment, but you knew you were going to Middlebury. When did you reach out to the hockey coach and how did that work out? Yeah. So, um, when I was, so the, the winter of 2019, I applied to Middlebury. Um, I thought I was ready to go to school. School is always, you know, academics were always, uh, the most important thing to me. So I was always very school oriented. Um, so I got into Middlebury academically. And I um, was trying, I just thought I was going to play golf at that point. And so um, I reached out to the golf coach and didn't hear anything back. And so, I, and then COVID was, was starting to happen. And I was thinking, man, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know. I don't want to go somewhere and not do anything. Yep. So kind of that, uh, that spring fall, I decided that I wasn't going to go to school. I was just going to defer and, and figure out what I was going to do from there. Um, I reached out to the coach in the, in that, uh, that summer. And, um, then he was just like, yeah, we'll watch you. And so I just kind of communicated him with him throughout the season, just, just kept in touch and, um, committed to play golf there and just knew that that was where I want to go to school. Um, uh, so I just, just worked on playing hockey and just doing the best I could there. And, and I figured, um, that if, if I did that, uh, everything would work out. So very, very lucky for that to work out. So you've known for a while then that you were going to go to Middlebury is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Just the school, the school and, and the location and everything that's, that really attracted me. When you look back with, are, are there times that you could maybe highlight where you thought maybe I'm going to play no sports and then now you're playing both sports. Did that happen for mm. you? So when I what when I didn't hear back from the golf coach when I was frustrated with hockey and I didn't I thought there's a time where I might might just focus on school and yep. focus on medicine which, which I'm interested in but but um my family is really good about centering me and just saying just make make sure you don't make an irrational decision and so it's so it's, I, I was I was thinking about it but but yeah. uh, eventually no I, I never wanted to do nothing I, and I, what's I, what's unique is I didn't know about all this from the academic perspective for you but. Uh, Every spring, college coaches reach out because our commitment list is so packed that they can't figure out who isn't committed. Mm-hmm. So 
numerous times last spring, I was asked, can you tell me that the, the best forward left that's uncommitted? I didn't know all this was going on. I said, you, yeah. how many yeah. calls did you get in the spring to try and convince you to do something otherwise? Um, I got a few, not, not too many. Um, Coach Mosser was really good at, at talking to me. I owe, I owe a lot to him. Uh, he was really good at talking to me and, and just, just communicating, make sure we were both on the same page with, with what I wanted. Yeah. So he didn't, he didn't send schools after me that, that I, um, that I wasn't serious about. Um, Cause I, I would never do that. Uh, yeah. Just so it was, it was, it was, I don't know. It was interesting. I got, <laughs> I got a few, but, but not, but not too many. Gotcha. So uh, take us back then. You mentioned a year off from hockey, but then the decision to, to go back to it. Um, mm. How did you find the Vermont Lumberjacks? So I'm, I'm right near Burlington. I live in New York, a uh, very small town in New York. And um, so I'm, I'm right across the lake from the Lumberjacks. So I grew up, uh, they started when I was, I don't know, 16, maybe. Okay. My, my brother played um, in the EHL. He played for Walpole. Mm-hmm. And so we, you know, we would go to games uh, when they were there because it was closest and, and um, just kind of always had a little bit of contact with them. Just say, Hey, if you want to play, um, yeah, just, just always in, in touch. Uh, Coach Masso was very good to me. And so that was, um, yeah, that was kind of how that happened. And then you played for them last season and I, I was hoping that it would be kind of a, a past topic for you, but COVID has already kind of, Mm. Shown his face again for your team so far this year and games that have been canceled so far. Um, is there a, is there a part of you that, that goes in the locker room and is kind of like, guys, I've already been through this with, with everything that the Lumberjacks went through last year. Mm-hmm. It, yeah, does that come um, up? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's flashbacks. Um, but, but so <laughs> many people have dealt with it too. So it's, it's not just me. Um, yeah. So many guys, you know, you know, they got their whole season canceled last year, all those guys. Yeah, people lost their season, so so they're going through it too. But um, but yeah, it's hard not to think about how literally almost the exact same scenario is playing out. How right before our first games were supposed to happen, someone someone's positive and, and we have to cancel. So, but but we have good leadership. We're um, we're we're gonna get through it, and, and it's it's lucky that it's early. Yeah, same thing with last year. When you look at last year and you look at all the hurdles that your team jumped through to, to getting on the bus, to turning around because of this mm-hmm. or that, to moving to Waterville Valley. Um, yeah. Do you feel it, it helped better all of your, yourself and your teammates as individuals? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm a big believer in that, and that things happen for a reason. And, and so I think that um, we had really good leadership from coach Masso when he, he was saying the whole time, um, you know, we were, cause we struggled. We struggled uh, when we moved to Waterville, we, we weren't, yeah we weren't uh, winning games. And so he was like, it's, it's going to click. We're just behind. It's going to click. And it clicked. Um, so yeah, it's, I think um, it definitely, it de- definitely made us all closer. I mean, we live together. We live r- right, right next door to everybody in a hotel. So, yeah. so yeah, definitely strengthened our team. We're on the, we, we were able to play, get on the ice, play all those games in such a short amount of time and, and peaked at the right time and just got a little unlucky and, and the final four. And, and- to get there, to get to the finals after mm-hmm. everything that you guys had been through, I know you didn't win the whole thing, mm-hmm. but do you still find the positives and the fact that you, you made it there? Was that almost like a, a victory in itself? Yeah, um, in, a, in a way, yeah. You always want to win, right? I think we were we were kind of kicking ourselves at because because we, we knew we you know we beat uh, BJR and that that first game. Um, we, we knew what, what we had and, and that we could, that we could have done and all, but yeah, it's, it was def- definitely looking back. It was, it was good. We were struggling so much. And then, uh, things just started to trend upwards at the right time and, and, and things clicked And So yeah, it was definitely, definitely a positive in the end. And now where you're at as a dual sport athlete, as a freshman, you know, mm-hmm. what, what are the goals for the future? What do you want to see yourself accomplish? <clears throat> obviously school first um, I'm just make sure I take get, take care of the school part um but I just want to just just continue to work hard and I think that's something that I've really um that has gotten me where I am just put your head down and work hard and, and things are gonna work out so just try to just try to be successful have a, have a good teams um throughout the time here and, and just enjoy my time and try to win as much as you can awesome well whenever yeah. we're near each other next we'll get on the golf course together because I'm, I'm not a college player myself, but I do love to golf and uh, we'll Good. make it happen. That's awesome.
Awesome. Awesome. That's Thank good. you for coming on and uh, we'll talk soon. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thanks again to Paul Fine Leash for coming on the podcast this week. A true story of perseverance. He actually committed to play golf at Middlebury. It's funny, actually. There were so many coaches that reached out to me about him last spring because they wanted him to come play hockey there. But he said, I'm going to Middlebury to play golf and I'm going to walk on the hockey team. And that's exactly what he did. So an awesome story for him, a Lumberjacks alumni. And let's bring in the E crew now. And guys, another event officially checked off we're just flying through this hockey season warp speed the warp speed we're the acela train going through every showcase of rio that we possibly can next up newington see you there in a couple of weeks best snack bar in the league i've been there two years either so it's uh there's just a lot of options it's it's like its own grocery store basically yeah it's a legit restaurant inside of a rink and fair warning this is the coldest rink sure it can is. be the coldest rink like is it, i don't is know it beat exeter as being the coldest oh rink? man exeter yeah. is an absolute like no. meat locker like put it this, this way Lauren, the last time we had the showcase there i remember brandon johnson the owner of the chiefs walking in and being like who turned the chiller down this low everyone was like chattering in their seats it, myself included with the it, headset on i was like chiefs well, down the corner with the puck it was cold well, as I just toe warmers for my shoes yes yeah. very wisely points out it is a hockey ring in the winter yes but they also yeah. had like the ac on it felt it felt that yeah. cold there this oh, time when we were there last oh, whatever that was though jeff good point feels like a half decade ago uh it's 2019 december of 2019 december of 2019 yeah. but so far this year we've already got five events done in three showcases and two all-star events um, and let's start talking about the all-star classic in the weekly rundown it's time for the E-Crew's Weekly Rundown. And the E-Show Weekly Rundown is brought to you by the Junior Hockey Podcast, your home for junior hockey news, knowledge, and nonsense. Check them out at tjhpodcast.com. And we've used round robins in the past, right? Whether, it, But mostly in the playoffs. So this is the first time I've ever used a round robin outside of the playoffs. And we need to all give ourselves a round of applause because after the first day, we looked like geniuses. <laughs> one, one and one across the board. That's true. Like, that's how it's supposed to go, right? Yeah. Like, yep. Well, you know, know what? Know. Well, hang on, because Team Gray was down in the, the first half of the second game, and it looked like they were going to get shut out for both games. Yes, and I was thinking, did. oh, man, I'm never going to play armchair GM again. This is awful. <laughs> and then Colin Bella, who I convinced Brett Trider to pick, ended up getting the hat trick. So I was very happy about that one. It's, it's just, when it plays out like that, it looks so perfect because every team was one and one in regulation, meaning the first two games uh, on Monday, the winners went to the championship, the losers went to the consolation. So clean, so easy. The past years that we've had the, the round robins at the finals, uh, we, we get later on in each day and it's like, all right, let's start getting out, you know, at the calculator, like you like to say, uh, you have yep, to figure out yep. the whole differential and this and that, but plus one minus two. It was two, so clean and easy. Three. You know, I guess the bad news for me is my team got fourth place technically. <laughs> All <laughs> said one, then done. But All right, Kamish. but they were so even, right? Like the team that I helped pick lost and definitely was last place, but had the only shutout of the entire event, right? The it's teams true. truly were so even. The comeback by Anthony's gray all-stars was unbelievable. Me and Tyler Rago calling that we were just dumbfounded to put it uh, <laughs> lightly, just four goals. And against Rodan Mobley, who has he led in four goals in a period this entire season? I don't think so, but obviously yeah. it being an all-star classic, as we talked about uh, on the broadcast, there's, you know, the likes of the Patrick Ruiz and Patrick Ruiz, Marty Broders and the NHL all-star games in the years past that they gave up buckets of goals too because they're going up against premium talent it was I, uh, I don't know i still think my red team should have been up to nothing after the first day i don't think we <laughs> should have lost out of the game there, there was a few iffy calls about some of those goals there was one that was literally right in front of our bench on the one side that was very clearly over the line and they were like no it's no goal like Okay. Oh, that's right. I do remember that. Yep. Oh yeah. We could all see it clear as day because of where the goalie was. And like, we could, we could all see it. And we're all sitting there like, what the heck? And they're just like, no, no. I'm like, oh, okay. 
Controversy. It, oh, yeah. Let's go it's redo still, it. Let's go back to the ice den. Regardless, <laughs> your team was still in the championship against still Jeff's was. team. No big the, deal. The two colors that we had already previously worn this year, too, which is kind of funny how that worked out because we wore the blues against Curry. We wore the reds against UMass Boston. Not that some good luck that means anything, I guess. But I called it at the beginning of the second day. I told Jeff, I said, it's going to be a red and blue rematch at the championship, and that's what it was. Started yeah. with it, Neil, and we ended with it. What is that? <laughs> symmetry. It was, uh, but That's you know, it, you wanted, but I for don't. something that we had never done before, like, like I truthfully get a little nervous every year, the day that we play our first college game, because you don't really know what to expect. And like, I don't want to walk in and just have our doors get blown off. And then all of a sudden there's another game the next day. Right. And before this, it was kind of like the same feeling, like, is this going to work? Like, I, I I had no idea. Like, we thought it was going to work. And overall, when you take a step back and you see, you know, the 20 different colleges that were there in person and you see all the colleges that have reached out that were watching at home, right? Like, the number of guys that replied to my email and said, thanks for the PDFs, printing them off. I'm, I'm sitting in my armchair right now for the next two days. It's like, okay, they're watching too. Like The, the response yep. from the event I guess it's just an extra feeling of pride to know that we got it right. Yeah. A credit to all the staff. Uh, we all worked our butts off. All the coaches were coaching hard. It was cool seeing, you know, like Ryan McGrath talk to Cooper Board from the Seco Spartans. And then you see Brett Trider talking to some different guys. And then you see coaches looking at their own players on the opposite sides. When Bella ripped off the hat trick, it was against oh, every the offense line. He would, he would sit right by simmering. Brownie. And at one point, I just, I'd see him look over at Backside and they just looked at each other and they were like, this is going to be a fun night at the hotel. Because they knew he was going to just be sitting there kind of gloating a little bit, being like, yeah, I put up a whole bunch against you guys. Same thing with Trider when Boardsy <laughs> got himself a couple of goals too. He was looking over at him like, mm, just kind of crossing his arms, simmering. The, be- the best line, I think, of the entire weekend was, actually, there were two, and they were both from Corey Felitti. <laughs> so, Corey's oh. first line, because uh, Corey was a coach in the blue team, he he went up to Chris Sorella and offered him five players in exchange for Matt Carlson. Seems like a very lopsided deal, but he just totally fell in love with that player during, during the event, right? So, I thought that was hysterical. Because that I thought, line... Cole Scott, Jake DiNapoli, Matt Carlson. I even made the trade on Hockey TV's airwaves. Yeah. I said, let's get him over there. Jake Whatever DiNapoli takes. was just popping Ooh. off in his games. Oh, the, my God. Speaking of lines, there was Evan Donnelly from Maryland, Spencer Quinn from the Ducks, Colin Callanan from the Apple Corps on Team Gray. That was a line, right? When Team Gray Crazy. played Team Blue, and uh, that was Felitti again talking to Kunes, who was on Gray, who's the coach of the Wolves. Wolves played the Spartans yesterday. Felitti said, don't worry, Kunes, I got you. Cooper Board's playing the whole game because yesterday the Wolves played the Spartans. <laughs> like, like, it was just, it was funny seeing that dynamic. And I think what makes it cool is like, when you get on the ice for our league games now, there's going to be the drive to go get your two points. But there's also some friendships that became established here. There's some respect that became established here that I think we're going to see throughout the rest of the year. But just to recap, so everyone has it at home, um, we did pick an all-tournament team. We'll start with the MVP, who was one of the forwards. You already heard his name once, uh, Colin Bella. He had nine points in the four games. His brother actually commented on the the Instagram post and said something (laughs) like, this is the least surprising post in East show history or something like that. <laughs> I thought it was pretty funny. Um, mm-hmm. And then the other forwards on the all tournament team, Jake, the Napoli, as Lauren just mentioned, had five goals, just five goals, no assists, but five goals. And like a hat trick in one game as well uh, yep. for team blue, Andrew Kimball on team white had a goal and four assists and, and maybe to Lauren's point red should have won because there were three members of the all tournament team that came from the red team and no Julius Cavando and James Mettler on defense, and then Marshall McCallop in goal. It, like I said before, I think it was cool that just the way that it all played out, there were obviously a bunch of other players that I think were also worthy of, of being on that all-tournament team. Um, you had Adam Bove, who had six points. You had Aiden Hodgkiss, who had a, had a hat trick at one point. In, I think it was the 
consolation game. I'm blanking on which game it was. There were so many that took place in a short yeah, period of time. Yeah, it was the consolation yeah. game. And, Go and Anthony Percy, red trade goal yeah, for he had, he had five points as well. So it's tough, right? Because it's the same thing that we run into at the end of the season when we're picking our all-division teams and this and that. No matter what you do, someone is going to be left off. But the point of the all-tournament team was there was at least one player on each of the four teams that deserve recognition, and that's what you see with that all-tournament team. So now, you know, as I, as I said to Justin on my way home, that is the first year of the EHL All-Star Classic. When I look at it and compare it to the first year of the EHL Frozen Finals, how do we make it better next year? Right. And, and it, was, it was a great event. And, and now, it, it's as I started up this podcast, it's hard to believe – that we have just two showcases in the finals left. That's that's it for big that events. That one like, was honestly yeah. a lot of fun. And speak on like the a whole oh like trade thing. I, I I I know I wasn't the only one. I talked to Coach McGrath about it too. I wouldn't want either of them to get traded because these two guys are like the lifeblood of their respective teams. But Billy Hartnett and Tyler Penry on a line together is like absolute magic. I don't like they're just very similar <laughs> players, and getting to watch the two of them work together was just amazing. They just knew where each other were all the time. They were just always doing good things. Like whether or not they scored or did anything, like they were just always looking good. And I'm like, this is just like so crazy to see and being able to be like right there with them and see them all so close like that. I was like, this is insane. And I think the vibes were great too, you know. Yeah, so now when we get to the Newington Showcase, watch when these guys see each other again and how they oh, yeah. interact because it's going to be pretty interesting to see. I think it was perfect, though. The guys took it, like, just real quick. They took it serious enough, but then it, there was enough fun involved too for everybody, right? For oh, yeah. For the coaches, GMs, broadcasters, players. Uh, oh, yeah. All it, was all, it was a good combination. Great time. Yeah, they were, the parents it was loved so it. fun being on the bench. They were just absolutely hilarious. The guys were just cracking jokes all the time. They were joking around with the refs too, which was fun to see. And like, yeah. they're just cracking jokes with each other. And they they come back on the bench and like, I'm so sorry I missed that pass. They're like, you set me up so good. I'm sorry. That's all me. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> and they're just, they're making jokes with each other. And at one point, uh, Adam Beauvais scored a goal, but as the guys on the bench were saying, it's a little bit of a muffin. And Beauvais comes back, and you just hear him go, "Do you know the Muffin Man?" And like everyone's just <laughs> dying, and they're just red team was just having a laugh the whole time. They were super serious and wanting to win, but like they were just also having a laugh, and it was great. And Pompaselli was the same way. At one point, at the like right before the first game, they were all getting on the bench. He goes, "All right, boys, let's have fun today." And then like what five minutes later, he scores. He comes back on. And I said, "Are you having fun yet?" He goes, "Oh, absolutely." Like yeah. they're just they're having a great time. Smirnov talking to the linesman saying offsides. Hey, you can hear his Russian accent. He's like, that was an offsides, man. It did the split. And they were like, dude, you're offsides. And he just was going at it for like how did minutes. it look from home, Anthony? How did it sound from home? It sounded great. I Jefferson and Tyler, uh, I thought uh, both of them did a terrific job on the broadcast. Um, at, at least when the when the broadcast is up, I know there's that one game where it, it, it wasn't up for a little bit, so I, I was nervous because I'm thinking like I gotta get video of this. <laughs> but the, uh, <laughs> I mean the, ho- the we hockey too, was good. We were nervous too. <laughs> the, the the hockey was good. I, I could, obviously I couldn't really hear any of the chatter between the benches, but you know it looked like the players had a good time, and you know, a lot of the games were competitive. I was hoping that maybe we see some overtime games, but Me you know, it, it, nonetheless, it, it was a great event, and it, from home, it, it looked good. It's funny that you bring close. that up because up until this past Frozen Finals, I'd always pointed out how we have this event that never goes to overtime. Remember, yes. I always said that, Jim. Yep. Like we, yep. we've had all these Frozen Finals games, until. and then they never go to overtime. But then all of a sudden. <laughs> The last time we had a championship game, the Rangers Avalanche went to overtime. So there is Long a one. future overtime coming in the EHL All Star Classic Championship game. We I almost don't had know a couple with those long empty netters, remember? <laughs> we had a bunch of those <laughs> yes. this week. The guys were yes. shooting from like the other end of the dot. Yeah. Like with Tyler Pedry's top play that we had a couple of weeks ago oh, for yeah. the Hamilton Showcase. It was like, what the hell? But it, you hey, know, maybe it felt- next year you try out a bit of a. Uh- 
skills competition. I joked about that with Penry. It was my first interview of the weekend. And I was like, but I that asked him, I was fun. like, if, if they did that, I was like, what kind of event would you be in? And I was so, I was, it was so unexpected when he responded to it. And I was so happy because I got him to crack a smile with that question. He was laughing about it. And I was like, oh, I'm like, we can be done with this whole weekend. I'm like, I got him smiling, laughing. Like, that's all we need. I'm like, we're good. We can shut it down now. He, he loved the question. He was, he said he'd be more of a shootout guy. So that'd be kind of fun to see. I hadn't thought about that yet. I had thought about a coaches slash staff game to wrap up the first day. And I actually started asking guys about that for this year. Um, for some reason, it did not get the traction that I had hoped for. So this is me calling what? out. This is me calling out our coaches and saying next year, we're going to do this. We're going to have a broadcasters and, game. I, well, it's coaches and staff. We'll, we'll, we'll have, we'll figure out two captains and we'll make two teams. I mean, I, I need to get back out on the ice before the Wolves JBT shootout. Like, I haven't Listen, been on remember, the ice since then. Remember Neil's filthy goal? Oh, the, <laughs> the first goal that I remember watching that my car last year, turning it right on, and <laughs> it's Neil. <laughs> oh my God, there he is. But then, but then tried to pull the Forsberg the next one and miss. But hey, you know what? It was fun. That's coming up right. in January, though. So, he looked a little, looked a little jacked of eye to that first goal, though. <laughs> Slippery um, mitts, buddy. Outside of the All-Star Classic, we did have, I guess we can call them a, a small handful of games um, since our last podcast. Yeah. Kind of a lot of teams' last games here before we get to December. Of course, we we do have a game tomorrow, um, the second annual Thanksgiving throwdown between the uh, Express and the Seahawks. I still have to record uh, Nash's pick for that. Of course, Nash picked wrong last year when I put the two bowls in front of him, and he he picked the Seahawks and the Walpole Express one. So we'll see what he does this season. But as I mentioned, there were plenty of games that took place this past Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, um, and they gave us a chance to potentially reset some of these power rankings. Um, So to start off in the EHL, uh, the number one team to me is still the Railers at 13-2-1. They didn't play. So they can't really move. So they, they yeah. can't really move, right? No. They they had a game that, that they that they rescheduled with the Lumberjacks. Um, as Jeff mentioned, there has been some sickness going on. So they found a date later on in the year that worked for both teams and both levels. So they stay there. And then Walpole beat the Rangers in the Avalanche. They have to go to two. Let's go. Let's move them up. Choo, choo. Yes. Red train, red train, um, red train. They, I think, I mean, and if you beat the two teams in front they of them, beat you, the you two have teams to. in front of them. Yes, but the Rangers are also eight and two over the last 10 games, 14 and two in their last 16. Like 100%. The alarm's they, on the BGR only, train now. Oh. I wouldn't say that, but I would, I don't know if they would technically, I don't know. I feel like they, I don't think Express could totally jump them. Just so yet. what? So who I mean, they t- did beat them, but like I don't think they could totally jump them just yet. Okay, so who's two? The Rangers. The Rangers, who since the last podcast shut the Chiefs out for nothing, and lost to the Express two to one in the shootout. See, I, yes. they they literally lost. They don't goal. let in. They don't let in a whole lot oh. of goals though. That's that's like that's what I'm saying. They only let really let in like one and like whatever in the shootout. So like they don't let in a whole lot of goals. So like, I don't see why they need to get dropped. So you're, so yes, you're going the express, the express are on a bit of a tear right now, but the, the Sixth is just like not really letting on a lot of goals. So like, that's kind of something you have to take in mind. I think. What, do you, what have you done for me lately? Express are the streakiest team in the league. They are. They lose six in a row or win six in a row. Then yeah, they're up, down, over, around. A lot, of, a lot of teams in our league have been like that this year, right, Neil? Yeah. Yes. Pro Tech started out hot. Valley started out hot. Then they kind of both hit Schneids. Chiefs and Rough Riders started out slow. Now they've picked it up. Wolves have picked it up. So in Pro Tech, it's the other way around, Jeff. They they started out pretty slow, but now they've picked it up. Ah, oh, that's what I, yes. I said yeah. this to, to Terry and Josh this past weekend. You cannot argue with the fact that of all the divisions right now, that one seems like – anyone could win it like yeah. there's favorites in the other divisions i don't know if there's a favorite in that division like you can make a case for all four teams you in really the could. south are you kidding 
You know, I'm not kidding. 87's finally snapped their losing streak. Yesterday. You can make a case for any of those four teams. paying attention to the little Flyers again. They're just, they're kind of, I think, I mean, yeah, Team Maryland is is good too, but I, I feel like the little Flyers have kind of. The little Flyers who haven't beat so Team Maryland and just lost to Protect. My point is anybody can win the South. I, anybody can win the South. It's a, it's a Thunderdome. I don't agree with it. <laughs> I think it's a strong, I think it's a strong division. There's good teams down there, but I think little Flyers kind of have it right now. And I feel oh. like the East is becoming Rangers Express Wizards. Maybe Valiant's the Seahawks. They're trying to stay in the pile there, but. It's surprising to hear Anthony start supporting the 87s when last week he said they weren't going to win again. <laughs> Did anyone hear that, Anthony? <laughs> from, from the 87 staff? I, I, I think so, but. <laughs> they, bold, they, bold and board material. But, they but, 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 here's, but here's the thing. Everyone on the 87s knows what sarcasm is. I, I know that might be a tough concept to grasp for but the three you, of but you. But do you know that? But, was, but do, you, do you really believe that that was sarcasm? I feel like there was a hint of truth to that, Anthony. Oh. You, haven't been, you haven't been picking your boys for fantasy in a while. No, because, and this, this is a matter of fact, right now the 87s don't have very prolific scores. Maybe Matt Zidanowitz, who's right around a point per game. But look, Last season, when we had Dante Taramani, uh, Kay Yasuda, Tim DeBoard, you could throw a dart at our line chart. And if you hit anybody in that top nine, it wasn't a matter of if you'd get fantasy points. It was how many fantasy points yeah. do you get? Like that one week where Jeff and I had almost 50 points, you could pick the like all 87s and you would break that mark easily. Yeah. But And again, this is just a matter of fact. Right now, this team is not scoring as much. But their defense is good. That Their goaltending is really strong with Jeremy Connor. They picked up Owen Haynes recently. So they're strong in the back end too. So that's why that they're still playing close games. And I pointed out with my broadcast partner, Chris Russo, that even during their eight-game losing streak, five of their losses were one-goal games. In the showcase, Jeff, I'm sure you remember, they had that 3-2 loss against the Avalanche. And yep. th- that, that was a terrific was game. Wire. Yep. Where, where they competed with the Avalanche, who's one of the hottest teams in the league right now, or at the time of the showcase, and they they were going toe-to-toe with them. So, look, I, I'm, I'm not going to disparage the 87s, but it's just a matter of fact they're not scoring as much. That That's still a good this I weekend. Think I, sk- I think I skipped ahead for us here because the fifth <laughs> team is going to be for someone from the South, right? Right. Well, let's go. No, we're, back still, to, we're still stuck on two. Yeah, so let's we go back to two, three, two. four because Lauren wants Rangers Walpole Avalanche. Yes. So would you say Walpole three, Lauren, or you have yes. a four still? No, three. I would okay. say they're three because I think the fact that the Abs lost to them and the Abs were like super hot, I think that puts them behind the Express this time. Okay, so that's she. Sorry, she wants Rangers Walpole Avalanche. That's one vote for that. Walpole beat both teams. To me, Walpole should be two, then Rangers, then Avalanche. I agree. Anthony, you got are you gonna back Neil and Jeff? Are you gonna back Lauren? Yeah, I think I'm going with you two, Neil okay. and Jeff. And then do yeah, we just, agree? But, that, but you said it yourself too. The Express is the Express has been very streaky. So I but just you just I think said it yourself. Record, right now they're all but, the way up. Now. But I don't think what I don't streak think, you beat both the teams of I just you. I don't think their record holds up yet against Someone like the Rangers, despite the but Rangers these losing power to them, are I don't also, think have you done someone holds lately? up. They're also yes and no. It's a they little bit of both. Yeah. I don't. I just. I don't think their their record holds up to the Rangers yet. So, the only response I have is that you just said that the Express beat the Avalanche, who were hot. The Express beat the Rangers, who were hot. The, the yeah. Rangers don't yes, give up but- goals. That's what I was just that's that's what I was saying. They only let it. They only allowed in essentially one against the Express. So I just I don't see that as enough for them to fall behind the Express. Well, they're weekly because yes, because yes, about. the Express are like on a hot streak right now. But the fact that they only essentially beat the Rangers by one, I don't think that's still enough really to put them ahead of the Rangers. Un- unfortunately, you were outvoted. Oh, I know. <laughs> so we go to five which I'm going to say little flyers then are we going to vote in consensus wow. here? I mean, I, <laughs> what, what's wrong for the with little say, flyers from more than me for once. Well, Woo. I mean, I could say protect who's now in second place and they've won four straight true. And they recently beat the little flyers, but I, I do think that when it all comes down to it at this moment, 
I will come out and say the Little Flyers are could win the South. I, I, probably, I probably would pick them to win the South right now. But I can also say in the next sentence, the South is as big a toss-up of any of the four divisions. I'm going to stick to that. I think so, too. I will like, say a special shout-out to the Ducks, though, for having the first female goalie play in an EHL game. That was pretty awesome to see Mr. Terry Watt putting her out there, being a supporter himself of women's sports. So that was kind of fun to hear about and fun to watch, and he was all excited about that and was – more than happy to talk to me about it after I broke him down. <laughs> yeah, that was a good interview. And learning, I just learned that he had the uh, PWHPA backgrounds in the, yeah, and the uh, NWHL and the NWHL with the yeah. for a while, which is pretty cool yeah. to hear. That's awesome. Between Pro Tech and the Little Flyers, is there anybody else that we could even say has an argument for number five? No, Possible really. receiving votes, if you will. No, I don't uh, think there is. And yeah. when you when you look at the two teams and ProTech and the Little Flyers, yes, I just threw it out there that ProTech is in second place, but they still have four games in hand over the Little Flyers. So again, when those games even themselves out, and the Little Flyers have played as much as they as Maryland has and ProTech has, I'm believing that they'll be in first place in that division. So to me, it's Railers. We just voted on this then. Railers, Express, Rangers, Avalanche, Little Flyers, receiving votes, ProTech. Love it. Yeah. Sounds good to me. Anthony? <laughs> yeah, I think so. And I agree with your point too, Neil, that the Little Flyers do have four games in hand with the ProTech Junior Ducks. They have six games in hand with Team Maryland. So I, I think if Philadelphia can keep up their pace, uh, yeah, they definitely look like the team to beat right now. And – we all know that they beat the 87s twice in a row, and those were tough games for New Jersey. So I, I do like what I'm seeing in Philadelphia. We said it before, them getting Sava Smirnoff, Adam Bove, and then Chris Blango all on the team. It has certainly uh, turned them into one of the stronger teams, not just in the division, but really in the league. Yeah. So And Smirnoff, too. He's a heck of a sniper. Looked good at the All-Star weekend. Had a couple of goals. Between now and next week's podcast, first in the EHL, um, there's a chance that changes could be made as the Seahawks and and Express play uh, a home and home, and then there's three games next Wednesday, the first. But these are probably the rankings that take us into at least the second week of December, depending on what happens this week coming up. So we go over to the EHLP. And things have started getting a little bit interesting because the Railers have lost a few games here. Is it enough to move them out of the top spot at this point, though, is the question. I know they're dominance. It's, it's a matter of you got to look at the rest of the league, too. Um, you look at the rest of the teams in their division. Hey, look at that. The Junior Rangers right there, eight and two in their last 10. They've won three straight. Including one five to one over the Railers. Yep. But – that's the only their first win over the Railers this year. The Railers have already got them twice. Right. So I think this one is much more of a conversation about what do we do? Seahawks, Seahawks and Warriors yeah. uh, split. I think the day that you were there, Jeff, yep. um, it was a Seahawks win, yep. seven to three. And then the next day was a two to one win for the Warriors. Avalanche have been playing well. They didn't play though this past week. So they definitely should not move. It's another. Railers Just Utah situation. They don't they shouldn't move because they didn't leave them this. right at three. Yeah. What do we do with the other three teams? And is there anyone that that has has an argument to go in? There's one that has an argument to go out, unfortunately. The lumberjacks, we give votes and they kind of fell short a little bit in the past week. So I don't think they can really get up there, unfortunately, this week. So we can we can scratch out them from receiving votes. The other team that received votes the last time we had these EHLP power rankings um, were the Warriors. But then the question then is just the order of the four teams. Like if the if the Warriors had gone down to the Cape and swept that series with the Seahawks, I think you flip flop those two teams. Seahawks yeah. are out of the top four. Warriors are in because they didn't do that, and no one outside of the teams that were in or receiving votes did enough to, to crack in. It's just a matter of what do we want our order to be? It was Railers, Seahawks, Avalanche, Rangers 
what is it now? So we want to do, well, like we said, the Avalanche, I guess, can't move because they didn't play. Well, it's tough, right? Because the Rangers yeah. really, that for as well we as the Whalers have played, like to lose five to one, that's that's a, a pretty I sound would, I would defeat. think the Seahawks go a little bit ahead of them because they beat Valley. They beat, they split with Valley, but then they're also eight and two in their last 10. So I think that's pretty solid. But what stock do you put in the Rangers being the team that beat the Railers? Like, who's number one? Do you think the Railers at this point have to fall out? No, I think if anything, they fall to two. I don't think they come out. No, I didn't, I didn't say fall out of the top four. I'm saying, do they fall out of number one? I would think the Seahawks could make a move to number one. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Seeing the Seahawks premiere in person the other day, that seven to three win over the Valley Juniors was a uh, pretty, pretty darn good win. And they looked pretty dominating. I haven't seen the Railers P. I don't think I've seen the Railers premiere yet this season, actually. Um, Plus, but obviously, we've seen the, everything on hockey TV. And had the Railers not taken that loss, they probably would have had a similar record to the Seahawks. So that would have made our conversation a little more difficult. So I think the fact that the Seahawks record is just a little better, I think that kind of gives them the edge this time. This is where I do agree with Lauren because we we keep talking about, or, or we we've said this a couple of times in previous podcasts where if the Railers play as many games as the Seahawks, they'd eventually overtake them. But while we kept saying that, the Seahawks just kept winning games. So I, I, I do think it's a testament to how well the Seahawks have been playing. And I think in this case, I do agree with Lauren. They deserve to go up to the number one spot. Yeah, so I think we found it, Neil. Seahawks one, Railers two. F three. because they can't move. And the Rangers, Rangers, Rangers who just beat the Railers don't move. <laughs> No, no, I, I, I think they should overtake the the avalanche. I, well, that's what I was trying to get to earlier about the absent play. We keep well, no, because there. because well, because we this before. this is the argument I made in the first week where yeah. if a team doesn't play, then I don't think that should be an excuse to keep them where they are. Because if if the avalanche are good enough, then they start winning the games when they start playing again, and they have to earn their way back up into the power rankings. So. I know on one hand, it seems like you're punishing them for not doing anything. But on the other hand, you have to reward the teams that are playing in winning games. Right. But I don't want to kick them out. We just want to move them I before and move the Rangers over. I disagree because so far this entire season, we have been leaving teams in their spot if they haven't played games. So we can't but, really change that now. It doesn't I think really it's a lousy precedent then. then well, that's that's just what we have now. We kind of have to stick to it at this point, otherwise. No, we're probably gonna start, no, we're, you don't we're, stick we're to gonna, that because but it's we're a gonna bad start process. Hearing from people after this, and they're gonna be like, "I don't well, care we what they say." There. Oh, we're gonna we're <laughs> never gonna hear the end of it. They're all just gonna sit there. You know, you know, Lauren. Like, you know, Lauren. Well, if, if the coaches there, complain to play. you, you direct them to me. I did this. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you can tell them that I did this. We just we hold on. In episode ninety nine, we just came up with the new motto of the E Show. I don't care what they say. That's it. That's they the are who we thought the they were. We let them off the hook. <laughs> we don't care what they say, but some teams seem to care what we say about the power rankings. I, the only thing I think where I'm trying to like side with Anthony is, is maybe the precedent is if the number one overall team doesn't play, you can't move them. But if you're yeah, out, it doesn't of, matter who it is. We've literally all you, the all Rangers so far, just we, beat the Railers the team, five to one. Literally, all say, season, this means, the teams that haven't played haven't moved. So we can't really change it now because then that kind of discredits a lot of what we talked about previously. And I don't really agree with that. Then I say I get, Rangers well, I are get. one, Railers are two, Avalanche are, are three, and Seahawks are four. The Rangers oh, beat no. the Railers five to one. The Rangers, last time they played the Seahawks, beat the Seahawks. I still think the Railers are looking better than the Rangers. And I, yes, they did beat them, but I just, I think the, the Railers are still looking better. I mean, I'm going to get outvoted, right? But like, let's just say it like it, it, you guys would like Seahawks, Railers, Avalanche, Rangers. One yes. vote from Lauren. Jeff? Well, I want to move the Rangers to three. I understand what Lauren is saying. I understand. I understand all sides. I know what Anthony's saying too. And I was kind of leaning towards what Anthony was saying as far as, yes, we've set a precedent where if teams don't play, they can't move. But if you have something like you had this week where a Rangers team takes over a dominating Worcester Railers team, uh, 
Yeah, but we've had this issue in the past and we still leave it as is. That's just what we've gone with. And now if we change it now, this goes against everything we've talked about on the power ranking so far this season. Jeff, are you voting on Lauren's Jeff, are you voting on Lauren's side? I want to stay in the (laughs) what you say? Just hold the, don't hold the door. I'm gonna leave. I don't. I don't want to vote. He's playing Switzerland. I want to abstain. Yeah, I'm playing Switzerland. I want to abstain. But you're not, pulling the 1776, not... where New York abstains courteously. There's not <laughs> enough vote to abstain, Jeff. <laughs> I know. I know. Just, just, you know what? Honestly, just say yes because you do, right? And I know yes, Anthony what? and I are willing to concede in the fact that Seahawks can be one warrior. Um, Railers could be two. We're going to make a push that Rangers have to be three to the Avalanche four, right, yep. Anthony? And then I like we're, that. And, and then Justin's going to have to come in and say he's either going with Jeff and Lauren or Neil and Anthony. Oh. Right? That's where I'm at. I guess. <laughs> Get to unmute yourself, Justin. Oh, I think he's... Yeah, even I'm torn on this one, but oh my god, I, <laughs> see, this is tough. Like this, I, I think you, I think you have to. I'm going with the precedent here. I think you have, I think you have to leave Rangers fourth. So when I post these, I'm gonna write a few changes in the EHLP power rankings based off of precedent. <laughs> yeah, you said I remember precedent. some situations last year with the Express and the Avalanche that have me voting this way. So. Yeah, well, at that time yeah, last we year, they set- were called Raffin's rankings, so this is why I brought everybody else uh, in this year. He was yeah, sick yeah. of it, so we, he said... We set <laughs> precedent all the pretty fire. early in the season, and at this point, we have to stick with it. Like, Man. Lauren, Lauren do, do me a favor. Never get a seat on the Supreme Court, please. <laughs> I still can't get over. I don't care what they say. That is the new model of the E-Show. We have to come up with a shirt that says, that has our not, logo. But after, he might not, but after last week, some people do care what we say, clearly. So, well, the, the front of the shirt is going to have our logo of the podcast, and the back is just going to say, I don't care what they say, right down the spine. So moving on, no, we'll go to fantasy. It's time for the E-Crew Fantasy Challenge. And the E-Crew Fantasy Challenge is presented by BioSteel, the sports drink of the EHL. Use the promo code ESHOW, that's E-S-H-O-W, for 25% off when you check out at biosteel.com. So I know Justin put this in the chat earlier, and I haven't had a chance to update the total points yet. So Justin, unmute yourself again. What did we each earn based off of what took place at the All-Star Classic? Or All-Stars earned you three points. Woo! The... <laughs> the gray team earned earn six points, red six points, blue nine points. Woo! Blue boys. <laughs> hey now. So uh, it's I felt so good after the first shutout, too. Like I felt so good after the first shutout. Did you? I, I, I was like got a little too got a little too confident. Oh, that's just the story of my fantasy season, right? <laughs> I hope you had the t- oh no sorry Justin I will stop saying like I did that with all the broadcast and got chirped for it. What you <laughs> were saying? Payroll. I was trying to say uh, yeah one more time by Daft Punk because it was the one more game that we had left. But we don't want to pay royalties as a league, you know. So <laughs> have to be careful. So adding in everyone's, I guess we have to add a new bonus column. Um, Anthony's point total now is at 242. Jeff is at 250.8. Jeff is out of the basement. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Oh, also, Neil, did we miss a bonus goalie win for me with Bird over the Avalanche? Nope. Because I don't think that ever posted. I got it. Oh, you did? I I don't see bonus. Shouldn't it be bonus goalie win? BGW? Oh, I counted it down below. I got to, I got to put it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, All right. Just double Neil check. Cheating. I no, yes. no. I, I, trust me, I counted it down below. Like I, I'll show you the math in a second. Um, Lauren is in second place, heading into Thanksgiving at two fifty two point four, no and deal. by the <laughs> widest of margins, I'm in first place at two fifty two point eight. So a whopping wow. point, point four point lead going into Thanksgiving. I am thankful for a few times. I am thankful for that. Um, to You're recap. Scoring. Uh, the fantasy points that we accrued from the games that did take place this past weekend. Uh, Trey Miller for me was in net for both victories and their home and home sweep. The ducks 
over the Apple Corps, which led to 15.4 points. Austin Pick collected seven fantasy points for me in the series they had with the Warriors. Um, for Warren, Billy Hartnett had five fantasy points in that series. Uh, Ryan Pompaselli himself had three. Jeff, as you just started to mention, uh, you got the bonus goalie win. So that yes, win for did. Scott Bird over the uh, Avalanche was a 10.8 point victory. Um, and coming out here soon, the stars of the week, actually two of them come from your t- your picks this past week because Dom Metro had three goals for you, including two on the power play for 11 points. Grund had Both balls in person. No big deal. Um, very interesting that I, I applauded Bill Zanaboni for this. Um, Andrew Kimball did not play in that Warriors series to arrest him for the All-Star Classic. Which is just something like another note just to like look back on, I think, when I'm resetting things for next year. Like to to Bill, as much as badly as he wanted the four points in, in that two game set with the Warriors, he knew how valuable the experience was for Kimball to take that rest before the event. So I, I thought that was interesting and, and I, I respected it a lot. And then for Anthony, um, he got an assist from Colin Callanan in that uh, home-and-home series with the Ducks. And then Nathan Miller got him 15.8 points while only earning one victory in two starts, which is pretty impressive as we've, as we've talked about Miller uh, on numerous occasions throughout this podcast. Um, with that victory, just to let everyone know where he's at now in the record books, um, because he's the only player that you'll see highlighted in, in bold because um, he's the only active player inside the top 10 for players or skaters right now. He currently ranks 10th overall all-time history of the league with 37 wins and tied for third all-time uh, with 11 shutouts. So I, I guess this is where, since we're not resetting any fantasy picks this week, between now and whenever the Rangers season ends at the EHL level, this includes postseason. Can Nathan Miller win 15 games to become the all time win leader in EHL history? And can he collect three more shutouts to become the all time shutout leader in EHL history? This includes regular season and postseason question for the crew. I think shutouts, yes. Wins is going to be interesting. Me and Tyler Arrigo had a great chance to uh, go down below as we did for after every game. We talked to Chris Jackson for a while, Neil, and he gave us a little inside scoop. He had said Coach DiCaprio was going to split them the rest of uh, the season. So splitting starts with Jackson, I don't know. Will he get that? I mean, then you got to see what playoffs, right? We talked about this last year is who's going to – take away and who are there going to be any teams that start two goalies because usually it's one goalie and one goalie just takes all the starts but the rangers have uh tough decisions to make with both of those guys and really impressed with jackson he's young but the guy's very mature the way he talks and talked about how him and nate uh live together and they really like how they drive each other in practice they're really good friends but they're also ultra competitive uh they really like to push each other and that shows with their play in net this year for Coach DiCaprio and the Rangers. And Jackson's only an 0-2. Yeah. He so is. he's coming back, right? Yep. So, like, let's go deeper into the question, right? So Miller started every game for the Rangers in the postseason last year because Jackson had kind of just previously got there. Is there value in this upcoming postseason in Coach DiCaprio giving Jackson a start, knowing that next postseason it's probably his net the entire time is there value in giving him a chance to play in a playoff game when i know i know to, we're not near the playoffs yet but like yeah. <laughs> well when, when it comes to the playoffs i don't think it's so much about development and getting experience in the the long term where you just need to win a series mm-hmm. so the way i see it i can't speak for rich dicaprio but i, I would imagine that most coaches go by if a goalie wins you keep him in. So if Nate Miller loses game one of the first series, then maybe he switches to Chris Jackson. And if Jackson gets the win, then he'll probably stay in net until he loses a game. And then DiCaprio might switch. 
So that would be the the most likely scenario I would see. But I would imagine that if, if you're looking to win a championship, you just need to go with the best goalie or the most experienced goalie. And that's uh, that's who they would go with. They have 24 regular season games left. If you maxed out how many games they could win in the playoffs to win the whole thing, it would be two in the first round to advance to the second round, two in the second round to advance to the finals. And then if they won their round robin, won both games in it, and then won the semifinal and championship, it's, it's four more, right? So you're maxing out a total of eight wins in the postseason. I, we obviously all agree that he's not going to start all 24 games. But back to the original question, could can he win 15 more games the rest of the way? I think as a group, we think that he could have three more shutouts and definitely get that record. Can he get 15 more victories the rest of the way, though? Because that's the only milestone that we're going to see. I mean, with the way this season is going, stranger things have happened. So who knows? (laughs) Fair. He has a good chance. I mean, he's going to play. Like we said, he's they're going to split the starts and then playoffs. We'll have to wait and see. Say he gets it. So you're saying, you know, they each get 12 starts down the stretch, right? 24 regular season games left. They each get 12 starts. He wins mm. nine, he wins 10, 10 of them. those. Right. It gets pretty interesting here when the, when the playoffs start to play themselves out. And as the season gets along, right? I mean, they're both human. They're yeah. going to make mistakes. You saw Jackson letting some goals this weekend where I kind of scratched my head and was like, hmm, he usually doesn't let goals in like that. But Again, all things aside, it's an all-star classic. But, yeah, as the season goes along, guys are getting more tired. People amp up their play. People are fighting for playoff positions. So, I don't know, Neil. 15s, that might be tough. I think I said the shutout streak, the the streak that he's on with shutouts, I think he might get that. A 15, I don't know. Did you hear the groan from Nash just now? He was kind of just like, I don't care. Thanks, no. (laughs) (laughs) But – uh, the last funny, the last funny goalie line that I have to share with Anthony because we went to dinner after the first night of the All Star Classic. When we pulled up the goalie stats at the end of the first day of the All Star Classic, it was funny that the leaders in terms of save percentage from day one were Adams from the Spartans and McCallum from the Chiefs and, and, and players like that. And then everybody was sleeping on McCallum. Well, hold on, hold on. The, the four. It lowest save percentages from the first day of the all-star classic were the goalie from the little flyers, the Rangers, the express and the avalanche. Yeah. Like what? Edson, Bosher, <laughs> Jackson, what? guys you would not expect to see at the bottom. Yep. So it that just, was the cool it, thing. That was the cool thing about the event though, too, is we were, and me and Tyler were saying that during the broadcast was can guys like McCallop and Adams use this to kind of springboard them to the second half of the season, carry that over and be like, Hey, I mean, hockey is a game of confidence, right? Whether you're a forward a defenseman or a goaltender. And if you played well this weekend, which a lot of guys did, can you bring that in and translate that to your regular season? When you guys go back to your respective teams, it'll be fun to watch. You know, 100%. So for now, I think with this debate, we just hit the pause button. (laughs) <laughs> and we'll come back to like, it because like it's going to be interesting to see. I'm excited to see where they all go too, because oh, yeah, some, sure. of these, some of these, some of these guys I had never like gotten to see so up close, especially with like the two Seahawks kids, especially they were really fun to watch. The Wolves kids were so fun. And Julius Kamandal, absolute ride. If you've never met that kid, so funny, absolute character someone you would definitely want on your bench for good team morale. Like, and he's really good player too. So I'm excited to see what else these kids do this year. He walked in the ice den at 8.30 a.m. <laughs> Sunday morning. I said, Julius, the game doesn't start till 11. I like to be early. You're like really early. Like like, <laughs> like really early. But okay, hey, get yourself super, ready. Maybe superstition. Who maybe, knows? maybe. But with that, let's get to what to watch for. Before we wrap things up, here's what to watch for this week in the E-Show. What to Watch For is presented by Hockey TV, the official streaming platform for your EHL and EHLP action through the 2021-2022 season. Typically, we all pick a game here, um, but there's not really enough to do that. So um, we're all going to be watching, of course, the game that we have on Thanksgiving, the, the, the second annual Thanksgiving throwdown. I think the, in talking with both coaches, um, what's unique 
Um, and what I like about it is last the year's express jerseys. Well, yes, the express jerseys. That's <laughs> one. Those are gonna be day jerseys. The uh, the uh, the idea behind it last year was obviously focused on COVID and the risk of sending the players home to their families just to come back and and you see some friends and you, you didn't know what could happen, right? I, I think now more and more teams are becoming interested in this type of idea, maybe not playing on Thanksgiving, but playing the day before or on black Friday, because when you go to college and you're a college hockey player, you're not going home Thanksgiving. Right. No. And that's where all these kids want to be right. And a year from now or two years from now, they want to be playing college hockey. So maybe we could get this to a point where there's more than one game on Thanksgiving. <laughs> I could try and push for that a little bit. No, Ooh, no, don't push too hard, deal. We don't no, push it without no only. round robins on Thanksgiving. <laughs> um, but well, it has become a big sports day, like Black Friday. A lot of people are off. Uh, I'll be doing Bentley versus Army Friday, Saturday. So D one is playing a ton of afternoon games from uh, college hockey for sure. And this weekend, for a lot of Division three schools, these four team mini tournaments have become very popular like the stove yeah. pipe and the rink that we were just at where, you know, you have a semi, you have two sets of semifinals on the first day, and then there's a, a consolation in the championship game the next day. So that's, that's just the future that I'm saying that these kids are going to see in a year from now when they're in college. But of course, that's the, uh, that's the game that I'll be watching. I think we'll all be watching on Sunday or on Thursday morning at 10 45 AM. Yep. Curious to see if Bill Zanaboni does what he did last year. Um, in which he went in the live scoring and he asked me for permission to change the venue um, of the game from Tony Kent arena to the Mayflower, um, which is what he wrote <laughs> last year on the website. And he just, remember it was, it was honestly one of the best laughs of the day. And I, I would imagine he'll probably do it all over again this year. Keep tradition. Tradition is good. Yeah. But I hope you all enjoy your Thanksgiving and uh, we'll talk to you next week. Yeah, happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Thanks for listening to The E-Show. Learn more at easternhockeyleague.org and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Also, be sure to subscribe and get notified when next week's podcast is released.